Hello, let's discuss this SDL titled testicular tumors. I'd like to take this one pretty deliberately and break it all down one section at a time. There is a lot here and there are many different facets of each particular variant of tumor. Now for boards, this stuff's pretty easy. Choriocarcinoma is the killer. It's the lethal one. It's got beta human chorionic gonadotropin 100% of the time. And then seminomas are going to be 50% of them. They've got a pretty bland bread and butter, solid histology, some clear glycogen filled cells, and really no tumor markers there. And besides that, they don't want to ask you too much about germ cell tumors. You might see one, maybe two questions about them. But for our house exam, we've got five questions on them and you want that A, I want that A, so we're gonna have to know all of this. Introduction. Testicular cancer accounts for about 1% of all cancers in males. Obviously, females don't get testicular cancer. The big risk factor is cryptorchidism, which means that, so the testes start off in the abdomen and they descend, and if there's a problem with their descent, if one of them or both gets stuck along the way, we're going to call that cryptorchidism. The incidence of testicular cancer in America is on the rise. Not particularly sure why. And finally, in this last intro paragraph, testicular cancer is associated with accurate serum markers such as beta HCG and alpha fetoprotein. And that's very important for tracking these cancers after you take one out. You typically remove the entire testicle or both, and that's called a radical orchiectomy. And so you'll want to monitor serum levels of these hormones, beta HCG and AFP, to make sure that the tumor doesn't start growing again or come back to make sure you got the whole thing out. Cryptorchidism. Interestingly, so when you find a cryptorchid testicle in a really young kid, it means it's stuck up in the abdomen. Typically what you do is you, if as soon as you find it, you just pull the bugger down, you know, and now kid's got two balls. He's cool. But it's, it's really weird that even if you pull the testicle out, you've still got an elevated risk of testicular cancer after you correct the cryptorchidism. So in, in some of these patients, you can get testicular tumors in the contralateral normal testis that was never cryptorchid. So really weird thing, big, big, big risk up to 11 fold. And if you see an exam question with testicular cancer, that's the risk factor. If they don't give that one to you, there are a lot more risk factors in this SDL. I imagine we're gonna get a question about it because there's nine of them total in here and they just wanna give you a money question that you can get right, but looks good on paper, you know? So what else do we have? Hypospadias, uh, that means that you've essentially got a, a second meatus on the underbelly or the ventral side of your penis. Uh, the urethra is going to open up there. And so when you pee, you're gonna be peeing all over yourself, essentially. If you get testicular cancer once, you're at an elevated risk for getting it again. First degree family history plays a big role. Infertile males are three times more likely to develop testicular cancer. Kleinfelter syndrome, Kleinfelter patients also are at risk for, uh, I wanna say breast cancer as well. And uh, I think that's gonna be 47 XYY if I'm remembering that correctly. Down syndrome as well, you've got an increased risk of germ cell tumors. Uh, that's typically going to be a 47 trisomy 21. Although in a, about 5% of Downs cases, don't forget that you can have a Robertsonian translocation involving, I think, uh, chromosome 14 and 5 and 14, I want to say. And uh, that's a accounts for a small minority of Down syndrome. Agent Orange. Um, first thing that comes to mind is that Eminem can rhyme like 12 things with Agent Orange. Uh, it was a herbicide, pesticide uh, used to control levels of bugs that eat crops by farmers. But in the Vietnam War, this was notoriously used as a gaseous weapon and it killed a whole lot of people and it caused cancer down the line in a lot more. So that pesticide, maybe you've got a big old vet and they come in with testicular tumor and that could be it. 
And then there's a racial and a diet component. Female sex hormones and dairy products. So don't, don't do that, yo. Come on, drink water. Good old healthy water. You know, they're putting so much stuff in, in these cows. And like, the thing is that like any, any food with fat in it and think about it, well, a lot of cheese, what's in cheese, bunch of fat, what's in milk, bunch of fat, you know, you can say that you're feeding these cows this and that, and it's clean, you know, but it's like the hormones that these cows make, what are hormones? Well, they're typically steroids, you know, and what's a steroid? Well, it's a lipid, it's a ringed lipid. And so what does that mean? That means it's fat soluble. And so when you're eating all this food, that has fat in it from animals, well, they're hormones. You're literally eating the hormones that they make in very small concentrations. And so as our cows get unhealthier because they just sit there and stand and eat Monsanto corn all day, you know, they don't actually eat grass. Well, what that means is that you're eating their bad cow bodies, you know, as opposed to the strong, healthy cows that we used to eat way back in the day. So uh, that's why it's really worth it to buy you know, grass fed, organic, cage free, all that jazz whenever you can. Uh, Cause you don't want those hormones. Those are weak cows. These pitiful cows these days would just lose the cow Olympics compared to the cows of the thirties and forties. So how do these testicular tumors present? They don't transilluminate. That's really it. That's how they're going to tell you in the test question. This dude's got a tumor. A um, couple of one other big thing it can be, it's not coming to me off the top of my mind, but a lot of things do transilluminate. So a hydrocele transilluminates. Um, a varicocele is going to, varicose veins of the uh, pampiniform plexus are going to transilluminate. And uh, if you've got a bunch of blood inside the, what is it called, process vaginalis, you know, uh, that's going to transilluminate as well. And so transillumination means you just take a flashlight or a pin light and hold up the scrotum and shine it through. And if you can see light coming through on the other side, well, then you know that it's just filled with fluid. But if you don't see any light uh, shining through that thin skin at all, what you know is that there's probably a solid mass down in there. And so what's the most common cause of a solid mass within the testis? And that's going to be cancer. Patients may note a sensation of fullness or heaviness in 30 to 40% of cases sometimes painful. Sometimes these cancers turn into cancers, you know, from just neoplasms. They invade, and so we call them a cancer, and then they might metastasize, and that'll be how we catch these things. A supraclavicular node, typically the left one right there. That could be a lot of things. That's the most common cancer node in the body. That's Verkhaus node, right? And so that could be what? Like gastric cancer, breast cancer, lung cancer, pancreatic cancer, metastasis, anything can mess there, you know? Or large abdominal mass, because again, in order to get to the supraclavicular nodes, typically these things got to go all the way up the periaortic nodes first. And so if a metastasis gets stuck in one of those nodes along the way and just decides to grow to the size of a bowling ball, there it is. In about 5% of cases, patients have systemic endocrine effects such as gynecomastia or hyperthyroidism. And that's because of beta human chorionic gonadotropin. And I want you to remember, recall from our physiology class, beta HCG has homology, sequence homology with FSH and LH and thyroid stimulating hormone. And they have a common alpha subunit. So what that means is that beta HCG can activate weekly the LH receptor, can activate the TSH receptor, can activate the FSH receptor. So that's going to, let's break this down right now so that we don't have to do it for the rest of this SDL. Where's the LH receptor in guides? Well, it's on your Leydig cells, L for Leydig, L for LH. So what happens when LH binds to the LH receptor on the surface of a Leydig cell? It makes testosterone. Right here, this is straight from first aid. How does it make testosterone? Well, binding of LH is going to upregulate the enzyme desmolase, which takes cholesterol and throws it to pregnenolone. And then you start making all these different things. You know, we've learned that. You've got your hydroxylases, but eventually you pump out androstenedione. And so this here, this image is of female reproductive anatomy, but I want you to understand that 
the specifics of the biochemistry in this flow chart are identical between males and females. The only difference is what the cells are and where they are. So in men, uh, the analogous cell to the theca cell, you can see that LH is binding the LH receptor on this theca cell. Well, in men, it's the Leydig cell that has the LH receptor on it. And then FSH, follicular stimulating hormone, men don't have follicles, but they do have a cell that expresses the FSH receptor, and that's the Sertoli cell, which is the nursing cell of these seminal tubule, seminiferous tubule. And so the Sertoli cell is going to receive all of the testosterone made by this Leydig cell through simple diffusion. And the Sertoli cell will take that testosterone and just like the granulosa cell in the female reproductive system does, the Sertoli cell is, has aromatase. So it can take testosterone and flip it into estrogens. So when you have a lot of beta human chorionic gonadotropin, what that means is that you essentially have a lot of LH because it can bind the same receptor. So if you have a lot of LH in men, you're making a lot of testosterone. You're also making a lot of estrogen. You're making a lot more than you normally should. So there's your gynecomastia. Hyperthyroidism. You're making a lot of beta HCG, some of these tumors. It looks like TSH, so it binds the TSH receptor, and there you go. It stimulates the thyroid to make some T3, T4. Lactate dehydrogenase is the one that you really don't have to know too well. Um, other than that, it's elevated in a lot of different things. And if you see LDH up, it means something really bad, badly pathological is going on in this patient but you might have a differential depending on what else is going on. You might not know why that LDH is up. Beta HCG, however, you, you know why that boy is up. Dude's got a testicular tumor. Same thing for alpha feta protein. Dude's got a yolk sac tumor. Like that's about the only thing that it could be. Maybe like, I think there's a protein in the liver that secretes AFP, uh, but like that's it. So very, very useful serum markers. You are going to see these things incorporated into your exam questions for PATH and ClinMed learn them, correlate them. Big ones to know are, let's take a look at this chart from ClinMed Urology. Choriocarcinoma, 100% of the time, every single time, this thing's making HCG. And that's because human chorionic gonadotropin, well, C, what does the C stand for? Chorionic. And so, uh, trophoblasts, I'm thinking choroid, you know, choroid plexus in the brain. What does that look like? Choroid plexus is this thing that kind of just looks like that, right? Like a, like a sea anemone or something like that, like a sponge. Well, what does the placenta look like? And the answer is it looks just like that. And so that's why this is called chorionic, you know, because there, these are chorionic villi inside the placenta. Dig that, yo. And these chorionic villi make beta chorionic gonadotropin. So if you've got a, a cancer growing in you, if you've got a neoplasm of which the cell of origin is one of these chorionic cells, it's going to make chorionic gonadotropin. So the choriocarcinoma, the cell of origin is the trophoblast, which is the only cell population in the chorionic villus. And you have two types. You have your cytotrophoblast and your syncytiotrophoblast. And that's the story for a different book. But for now, you really got to understand this. Beta HCG indicates that you've got some trophoblastic component to whatever testicular tumor is going on here. And so because testicular tumors are often mixed, that means that they can have multiple different cell types in them, what that means is that the amount of HCG that you're seeing in the blood is kind of indicative of the degree to which this tumor has a trophoblastic component. I hope that makes sense. Something else of note is that 
Seminomas are going to account for 50% of your testicular tumors. They're benign. Not really, but I, they can go malignant, but not very often. Uh, these guys are easy to treat. We like them because we can just zap them with radiation and they're like butter in the microwave. And so seminomas very, very rarely have any tumor markers associated with them. Sometimes you'll see a mixed seminoma with a trophoblastic component. It'll spit out a little HCG, but that's uh, the minority of cases. Usually you've got a pure seminoma, which never, ever, ever is associated with tumor markers. So if you see a tumor marker, you're dealing with a non-seminomatous tumor. Now we've got a good look at epidemiology. Useful table here for getting your bearings. Seminoma, 50% of adult testicular tumors. And notice that this table is divided by adult versus pediatric presentations with pediatric here on the left. And notice that the pure teratoma, that means Pure, when we say pure in this lecture, that means that it's not a mixed tumor. Pure and mixed are like opposites when we're talking about testicular tumors. Mixed means you've got two, maybe three, maybe four different tumors up in there all at once. So you've got a lot of different cells of origin, but pure means you've only got one histologic type under the microscope and you can't find any else. So pure teratoma is just a teratoma. What's a teratoma? It's a germ cell tumor derived of cells of endodermal, ectodermal, mesodermal origin. You've got, uh, you've got a lot of layers up in there. You've got all, typically all three uh, germ cell layers involved as opposed to something like a, I don't know, a leomyoma, you know, which would only be a mesodermal tumor. And we've also got these things called sex cord stromal tumors. So a germ cell tumor pops out of a germ cell. So what's a germ cell? Well, like a sperm, you, you get it, or like an egg in a female. So the, the cells that can be haploid and can undergo meiosis, that's a germ cell. Every other cell is not a germ cell. So a Leydig cell, that's not a germ cell. That only does mitosis. That has nothing to do with meiosis, right? So, Sertoli cells, your Sertoli cells aren't going out in your ejaculate. No, like that, that, that thing only does meiosis. You don't want a Sertoli cell up on an egg. It's not going to fertilize it. A granulosa cell tumor, same thing there. It's just a normal dude. It's only going to do mitosis. So those are the minority of cases and we'll save them for the end of this because they're really rare and you might see one question on those on a test. Your money's going to be with the seminoma because it's the most common in adults, so get ready for it. Your money's going to be with the choriocarcinoma, because even though it's 0.1, it is going to kill a patient pretty quickly. Maybe a mixed tumor, just to test your understanding of the concept, you know, not specifics, not details. They're not going to ask you to spit it back. They're going to see if you understand that there's two different types of uh, cells of origin within this one tumor, you know. And then a uh, yolk sac and embryonal carcinoma, also popular because they've got particular tumor markers and particular histologies as well. So germ cell tumors are the majority again. And then germ cell tumors are subdivided. Before we talk about that, some characteristics common to all germ cell tumors. With the exception of the seminoma, most germ cell tumors are aggressive. They want to invade. They want to invade vasculature. They want to invade lymph nodes. They want to grow and get on out of it. Although with current therapy, most germ cell tumors, even if they're angry and aggressive, can be cured. Germ cell tumors. Again, we're talking about a big, broad category that accounts for 95% of testicular tumors. They arise by germ cells, and germ cells are totipotent. So what does that mean? That means they're totally potential. And you understand the idea of potential because you've had physics, and you've seen the rock at the top of the hill, and the rock rolling down the hill, and the rock at the bottom of the hill. And so that's potential and kinetic energy. And I want you to understand that humans are the exact same thing, because when we're young, that's the equivalent of being at the top of the hill. 
because the hill is time and you're going to go down the hill, you know? And so you're going to be forced to take your potential, what you could be and transmute it into who you actually are. And so that's potential versus reality, you know? And so I want you to understand also that cells operate just like that too. A young little baby cell can be anything in the world and that's your germ cell. But then it's got to become something like we as people literally have to become something. You can't be a baby forever because time exists. You're going to change. No way around it. Same thing for these cells. So are, am I going to be a neuron? Am I going to be an osteoblast? Am I going to be a myocyte? I don't know, but let's find out. So that's differentiation when a cell chooses what to specialize in. When it grows up and what it chooses, it's not really a choice. It's based on its environment which is kind of like how people are, to be honest. It's just nobody will admit it. So that's the totipotent germ cell. More than half of germ cell tumors are going to be said to be mixed tumors. And remember, we said, what's the opposite of that? A pure tumor, pure water, you know, like uh, DJ Mustard. Uh, so a mixed tumor is going to be like a seminoma plus a yolk sac tumor or like a seminoma plus a teratoma, but then a pure tumor would be just seminoma under the microscope. We brought up germ cell tumors are subdivided into seminominous and non-seminominous tumors, but you can also talk about germ cell tumors based on pediatric versus adult, because it really does cut your differential in half. There's some you'll never see in kids and some you will never see in adults. So pediatric germ cell tumors tend to be teratomas, epidermoid cysts, and yolk sac tumors. And that's a malignant tumor. These first two are benign. The other testicular tumors are very rare in infantile peds patients. You do not see carcinoma in situ in these patients. So let's go down and visually, let's get a feel for what we're looking at here. Pediatric patients get these epidermoid cysts. Let me go with a bigger pen. They get these epidermoid cysts, right? And they get these infantile yolk sac tumors, and then they get these infantile teratomas. If you've got a kid with a testicular mass, these things in green, that's your only differential. That's it. That's the only three things it can be. They're not going to get a spermatocytic tumor. And in fact, I'm going to put that in blue because that's kind of its own thing. Really benign tumor. Uh, you got to be basically 65 and up to get this tumor. You got to be really old to get it. And it's not going to do a thing. You can practically leave it in. Um, and then all the rest of these on the right side of this, at, after the neoplasia in situ, these are the adult tumors. That's where the questions are. So going back up, adult germ cell tumors. Again, these are tumors that pop out of totipotent, meiotic capable cells. And the adult germ cell tumors are constituted of seminomas, most common 50% embryonal carcinomas, mixed testicular tumors, mixed meaning there's two different lineages in there. And they like to pop up in fairly young men, uh, definitely not old usually, uh, before the age of 40 typically. To put a little layer on this, testicular germ cell tumors in adults are characterized consistently by isochromosome 12P. You put that in your brain and you don't let it out until after you take boards, then you let it out. But like, yo, isochromosome 12P, every single one has this. In adults, in kids, no, don't pick that. Don't pick it, it's not isochromosome 12P, it's something else. And it says that here in the SDL. In contrast, germ cell tumors in kids are typically unassociated with 12P amplification, tend to be diploid instead of aneuploid. Aneuploid, aneuploidy, meaning an abnormal number of chromosomes. Diploid, meaning 2C, 46 total. In addition, 
kids' germ cell tumors are characterized by global hypermethylation of the genome. This particular RUNX3 gene promoter is seen in 80% of cases, codes for a transcription factor. It's a tumor suppressor gene. So if it's really, really methylated, that means that it's off like a light switch. You know, it's like it's, it's not on because uh, that's what methylation is. It's the epigenetic light switch. Here it is again. Isochromosome of the short arm of chromosome 12, and that's the P arm, and the Q would be the long arm. That's a consistent marker of all adult germ cell tumors. What's an isochromosome? The Q arm is lost, and there is an extra copy or more than one copy of the P arm. And I want to give it up to whoever put this sentence in the SDL, because for once, I don't have to consult my first block lectures. Yo, like... <laughs> Let's go. One more time, kids, hypermethylation, RUNX3. Now let's talk about something important, precursor lesion, carcinoma in situ. We've seen the concept of a precursor lesion before. We've seen it in colorectal carcinoma, right? There's a characteristic sequence KRAS into P53, you remember that stuff. And then pancreatic tumors as well, something similar is going on there where you've got a stage one, two, three, and four precursor lesion, then you get your cancer. GCNIS, germ cell neoplasia in situ. Looking at the flow chart, this in situ neoplasia can become a plain seminoma or it can further differentiate into a non seminoma. So, what every adult testicular tumor has in common is that it goes through this in situ precancerous lesion phase before it hits the big leagues. It's got to go through the minors. So what does this in situ precancerous lesion look like? That's more important than the words right now. Well, here's our normal seminiferous tubules. You've got a bunch of spermatogonia along the outside. And spermatogonia are going to divide and replicate as they move inwards. And eventually, there'll be sperm, normal sperm, ready to go, ready to rock. And this is where it happens. And so, this is also where your Sertoli cells are going to be located. They're going to be big old things that are up in here. And this is also where your Leydig cells are going to be located. And your Leydig cells are kind of interstitial in between these tubules. And so, remember, let's wrap it once. The Leydig cells have the LH receptor, and they're going to make testosterone, correct? And so testosterone, we'll put it in red. No, not red. Testosterone's just made by these Leydig cells and it diffuses into Sertoli cells. And then what happens to it? Well, Sertoli cells produce, what is it, androgen binding globulin? Yes, and so that'll bind some testosterone and hold on to it and sequester it inside the seminiferous tubules because testosterone is really great for these things' ability to produce sperm. But then it'll take some of that testosterone and it'll turn it into estrogen using what enzyme? Aromatase, correct. And so what's the enzyme that LH upregulates to get testosterone? Desmolase, bang, there we go. That gets cholesterol going into the steroid biosynthetic pathway, and then you can hydroxylate it in any direction you want. So that's normal seminiferous tubules. If you've got a precancerous in situ lesion in the seminiferous tubule, here's what it looks like. Yeah, no sperm up in there. No sperm. You just don't see them, you know? So they should be all up on the inside of this lumen, but the lumen's kind of floppy, kind of collapsed, you know, uh, looking like a blown tire or a pop balloon. And you notice these basilar cells, we're going to say that because they're on the 
basement membrane of this uh, tubule here. They're kind of big and kind of, uh, some of them are starting to look atypical. Specifically, you know, this one right here is just, uh, I mean, it's got no cytoplasm left in it and it's just all nucleus. So the strange swollen look of those basilar cells plus the absence of spermatogenesis is going to clue you into the fact that this is abnormal cell growth. Here's another look at it. You can tell there's no sperm inside the lumens of these precancerous in situ seminiferous tubules. You can also tell that these cells inside the tubules are getting pretty big and pretty swollen, and some of them are starting to look a little randy. And so that's why this is the precursor lesion for germ cell tumors. That's why these are called germ cell tumors, because what are these cells in the middle of these lumens? They're germ cells. They're spermatogonia, right? They're sperm. So it's like, and that's why it's called seminoma too, is because what do these cells become when they grow up? Semen, sperm. So there we go. One more look. Um, let me see. Oh, this one's great. This is beautiful because what we've got here is comparing a nice normal seminiferous tubule with nothing wrong with it at all. That would be here in the middle and I'll highlight it in green. We've got a seminiferous tubule here that is cool as a cat doing its normal thing. And then adjacent to it, to the left of it on this slide, we've got a really messed up seminiferous tubule that you would be able to correctly label a germ cell neoplasia in situ because we're not seeing any sperm inside the lumen of this. We're seeing proliferation of these basilar cells, these spermatogonia that are lining that basement membrane. And same thing going on over here, uh, just not as advanced. So that's your precancerous lesion. And to refer back to the flow chart, what we just looked at is This dude right here, germ cell neoplasia in situ. So that's going to become all of the different adult testicular tumors you could possibly see, what we just looked at. Now, you're going to identify this thing and you're going to say, well, you're going to differentiate it from other possible lesions based off of histochemical staining. So what's your differential? Well, uh, disorders of sexual maturation, right. So maybe you've got a 17 hydroxylase deficiency in which you just are not making a lot of androgens to begin with. Um, because think about it, that doesn't just affect the adrenals, that's going to affect the testes in males, because we just said that in your testes, how do you make testosterone? LH binds to receptors on late egg cells and it activates desmolase, which is going to kickstart steroid biosynthesis and so to make testosterone down in the testes you need 17 decimally so if you have a deficiency in that your seminiferous tubules are going to look whack yo they're going to look just awful they're not going to have any sperm down in there you know and so you've got to differentiate these things if you're just faced with a pure histology slide and so that's where the immunohistochemical stains come in things like klein filters too anything that's going to uh, cause an absence of testosterone is going to be on your differential just purely histologically for this germ cell neoplasia inside you. And so what can you drop on it to make it glow? Plap, love it. Oct4 and C-Kit. We got some fun, fun uh, stains this time around. Plap, what an onomatopoeia, you know, a lot of things go plap. I won't name them, use your imagination. Nothing I know says Oct4, though. You know, that's not really a sound effect that you'd see in a comic book page. So that's your precancerous lesion. Now, we break a little bit down into the, the history and uh, kind of peculiarities, the lineage of, of these different tumors. And we start to get into why 
we break down seminomas versus non-seminomas. The, re the big reason why we do so is for purposes of treatment because we've understood for a long time that seminomas, the plain Jane seminoma in the middle there, again, responds very well to radi radiation therapy. But non-seminomas do not. We got to use chemo on them. It's the, the big clinical difference between these things. So the seminoma is a common precursor to other forms of invasive germ cell tumors. And so that's the second big difference between seminomas and non-seminomas. Seminomas are just going to stay in the testes nine times out of 10. Non-seminomas, they want to get out of the house and adventure. They're ready to go. They want to see the world. Um, something interesting here, the word intratubular. Intratubular, that word here. So uh, continued proliferation of germ cells within the seminiferous tubules yields intratubular testicular germ cell neoplasia, which becomes carcinoma in situ. So if cancer, remember, 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 you've got these ridges in the embryo and germ cells are going to migrate to those ridges, right? They're going to start off outside the ridges, but then they're just going to drive their car right to that sex ridge, that gonadal ridge, I think it's called. They're just going to park it there. And then your seminiferous tubules start to form. So if, if you get cancer, if you get a mutation that leads to cancer after those seminiferous tubules have formed, then you're already in this GCNIS territory, really. But if you get one before they form, like, well, then you're prone to things like the epidermoid cyst, the infantile teratoma. Like, this is before they really get into the seminiferous tubules. I brought that up really to review the embryology there. A uh, bunch of stuff here you can read for your own good. I didn't see anything too important in it. Top of page eight, in many cases, germ cell tumors contain both seminoma and non-seminomatous elements. What's that going to be called? A mixed germ cell tumor. So understand we got to treat these like non-seminomas. So you can't just zap them with radiation because they do have that non-seminomatous element. And from here on out, we're in the territory of the adult germ cell tumors, which means we're in the territory of the isochromosome 12P, which means it doesn't have a Q arm, right? So all these tumors we're about to talk about have that in common. Seminomas, 50% of adult germ cell tumors. Seminoma cells are morphologically similar to spermatogonia. They arise from the germinal epithelium of the seminiferous tubules. Almost never occurs in infants. So I've got a quick question. Germinal epithelium. What is that, yo? So, all right. Dig this, yo. I was wrong about something. I said... Seminomas come from spermatogonia. No, 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 no. That's wrong. Get this. Get this, yo. Get this. Seminomas come from the epithelial cells that make the lumens of your seminiferous tubules. So here's your seminiferous tubules. These darker pink cells, take a yellow highlighter, along the circumference of one of these lumens, it looks just like the kidneys, right? what looks like the basement membrane, those are epithelial cells holding things together. So that's the cell of origin for a seminoma. Okay, that's really important. And I'm going to watermark and highlight that and make sure you guys see it. Um, the epithelial cell around the outside of the seminiferous tubule is the cell of origin for the seminoma. So just because it's a seminoma, it's called that. Don't be like me and think, oh, the sperm is the, the primary cell of origin. No, 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 no. So they look like spermatogonia. These cancerous cells do. 
but they're not. One more time, they're popping up from epithelial cells. They've got epithelial origin. So the equivalent to the seminoma in the females called the dysgerminoma, and that's also pretty popularly tested pathology, again, for a later date. Now, normally I skip straight over the gross pathology, but in this case, it's kind of useful because a seminoma being the one germ cell tumor that's pretty benign most times, is just going to be plain Jane. You know, it is a five out of 10 cancer. It is, it is, <laughs> it knows its place in life. But at least it's not one of these, uh, you know, embryonal carcinomas. Oh, oh, that's, just, oh, you know, like, uh, it's like, you, you love ugly people, but it's like, I mean, they're not even ugly, you know, because it's like, that's unfair to call them ugly. It's like, ugly is so relative. And it's like, who came up with it anyways? But like, one cannot deny that the concept of beauty and ugliness exists amongst social humans. It's like, that's kind of the truth, you know, like, we all believe in the same thing inherently for some unknown reason. So it's like, that's an ugly tumor, yo, you know, that's, oh, that's an ugly tumor. And like, in comparison, you know, it's like, oh, this, uh, this, this seminoma is starting to look pretty cute. So, uh, plain, cool tumor, nothing really wrong with it, not bleeding all over the place, not leaking anything out. So that's a seminoma. You see one of those grossly, you got a seminoma on your hands. Let's break open the histology. You're going to see sheets of cells and some fibrous tissue, and it's going to have lymphocytes in it. That's a big deal, big, big, big deal, because we're not talking like three lymphocytes. We're talking 50 lymphocytes. We're talking 500 lymphocytes. A lot of lymphocytes are in this tumor. The tumor cells in question, so the what's the cell of origin? Germinal epithelium. These tumor cells are going to have big, watery, vacuolated cytoplasm due to a lot of glycogen in there and they've got big round nuclei too let's check them out so typically a solid tumor what's that mean that means no cystic spaces no large dilated empty spaces on histology a couple of these other ones, like yolk sac, choriocarcinoma, you might see these big empty spaces, but not with the seminoma. Also, of note, fibrous bands, we just talked about those all over the place here. And invested in between individual fibroblasts of these bands are going to be lymphocytes, which are these just tiny little dots. You guys know what lymphocytes are, but just understand that uh, kind of within this bracket of fibrous tissue, you see lymphocytic proliferation in uh, investiture. And then the tumorous component would be this jaw in the middle here with pretty swollen uh, round cells with big nuclei as well. And you're not really getting the glycogen cytoplasmic effect here, but you sure are on this slide. So we just use yellow, we'll use it again here on the right side of the screen is our tumor. Right here is a blood vessel in the middle of it. And these cells are kind of empty, you know, and that, that's, that's all the glycogen. So same thing again, lots of fibrous bands investing through the tumor, creating nests or cords or sheets, however you want to say it, just understand it's a solid mass. And that's a couple typical seminomas. What can we splash it with to make it glow? We can throw some C kit on it. We can put some Oct4 on it. We can put some PLAP on it. So same, same exact markers histochemically that our in situ precancerous lesion is gonna express. They've got an isochromosome 12P. That's all you gotta know really. And you might see elevated lactate dehydrogenase levels in a seminoma, but there really are no reliable tumor markers. It doesn't release AFP. It doesn't give you any beta HCG reliably. These things like to metastasize. Even after metastasis, the seminoma, from what I understand, is not particularly locally invasive and we also like it, again, as practitioners, 
because we can radiate it and we can't radiate these non-seminomas. Speaking of which, let's dig into these non-seminomas. The spermatocytic tumor. All right, so this dude right here, I circled in blue earlier and I said this spermatocytic tumor is just the exception to all of the patterns and rules that we talk about throughout the rest of this SDL. The spermatocytic tumor is found in relatively older men. It is not a subtype of seminoma. It is not linked to cryptorchidism. It is not associated with the precancerous germ cell neoplasia in situ. Tumor markers, usually negative. It is a slow growing tumor that doesn't metastasize and the prognosis is excellent. Genetically, what you wanna note is an amplification in chromosome 9P. And I suppose one other thing that I just caught is it's going to stain with VASA. VASA? VASA. VASA. Yeah, 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 VASA. So it's going to stain with VASA and not plap. No plapping here. And one more time, the old 9P amplification. Only thing in this SDL that has that. Everything else is going to be isochromosome 12. Now we get into our non seminomatous tumors. Can't treat them with radiation more invasive and aggressive. Reflecting their dedifferentiation and local invasion. When a tumor just encroaches and starts to conquer new territory, some of that territory is blood vessels. So when a tumor just punches a blood vessel, what's it do? It bleeds. It's the only thing blood vessels are good for. So you're gonna see hemorrhage. It's gonna turn into necrosis as tissues are deprived of oxygen. You understand how that goes down. All non-seminomatous non tumors, all. When they say all, they're saying, we're going to ask you a question about this. <laughs> or it's going to be in the stem of the question, you know. All non-seminomatous tumors harbor isochromosome 12P. First, we've got our embryonal, embryonal carcinoma. All right, so the summary. This thing can show you alpha fetoprotein, and it could possibly show you beta HCG. It's gonna stain for PLAP and OCT4, but a couple things particular to it. It's gonna stain for cytokeratin. It's gonna stain for CD30. This is an aggressive tumor. This is not the worst testicular tumor, but this is a bad dude. 10 to 40% of patients already had metastasis upon diagnosis. These tumors have a propensity to invade the tunica albiginea and extend to paratesticular tissues the reedy testes, and the epididymis. So understand that your seminiferous tubules drain into the reedy testes, which is kind of analogous to the medulla of the kidney, um, and, or maybe even the, uh, oh, what is it called? The pyramid strain into the pelvis, pelvis. So the reedy testes is analogous to the renal pelvis. Renal pelvis, yes. And then the reedy testes empties into the epididymis and then the epididymis into the vas deferens and then you kind of got your bearings now. Bad tumor, foci of necrosis, foci of hemorrhage. You can see that histologically as well as grossly in this particular slice of tissue. A lot of red blood cells up in here, just a dumb amount of red blood cells. Um, I'll zoom in and point them out for y'all. Let's see, green. Uh, like right through here is a capillary uh, that's, or maybe even not a capillary, maybe just just blood cells been spilled. Uh, there's a lot more right there. Uh, there's a big clump. So look at how highly vascularized this thing in it, and this thing is. And remember that tumors love to promote uh, angiogenesis because it feeds them and it also enables them. It, allows access to the bloodstream. And so with that increased angiogenesis, that's also feeding into the hemorrhage here as well. And that's going to be mediated through like VEGF, uh, 
HIF1-alpha, which is our von Hippel-Lindau protein that goes up whenever you knock out the VHL gene, remember. Neoplastic cells in the embryonal carcinoma, large and anaplastic with hyperchromatic nuclei, prominent nucleoli. Let's take a look at a couple. So, <laughs> love this dude, whoever posted these on the net. Overlapping pleomorphic or ugly looking cells. And it's just like, that's the truth. Some of these cells are uglier than others. I'm sorry. Like, I'm uglier than a lot of people. I'll admit it. You know, compared to some people, I'm an ugly looking dude. And it's like, compared to some cells, these are some ugly looking cells. We got PLAP positivity. We got OCT4 again. We got CD30 plus. We got cytokeratin. We got an isochromosome 12P. Again, it's positive for alpha feta protein and beta human chorionic gonadotropin. What are we really looking at here? Well, a messed up cell, a couple messed up cells, really, really uh, out of control mitotic figures. Here's a hyperchromatic nucleus. Here's a hyperchromatic nucleus. Another one bottom right, another one bottom right, uh, bottom left, way bottom left. So ugly nuclei all over the place. We know that this is a very de-differentiated compared to this, uh, just in comparison, pretty harmless seminoma. Here's another embryonal carcinoma, overlapping, ugly looking pleomorphic cells. What's pleomorphic mean? Waiting on you to tell me if you haven't said anything yet. Think really, what does pleomorphic mean? It's a great doctor word to use, you know, it's like, I mean, it's like I'm at the store and I'm like, oh man, I got some really pleomorphic broccoli today. It's like a really pleomorphic steak. <laughs> Means that one cell versus another cell versus another cell, they don't look like each other at all, you know? And so if it's not pleomorphic, that means all these cells look the same, which is kind of good because that means you got normal histology going on. But pleomorphic means like, whoa, this cell does not look anything like its neighbor. So you, you're understanding that that means that there's a higher degree of genetic variance between neighboring cells leading to phenotypic variance because phenotype is downstream from genotype. So big messed up cell, big messed up cells, um, some really uh, active, active mitoses here, you know, like when it's oblong instead of spherical, the nucleus is. And uh, this dude is balling out of control down in the bottom right there. Uh, bottom left, more messed up nuclei. You know you're looking at a bad tumor. Here's one. I would call this a mixed tumor. And I would uh, have some confidence in this because this up here to me is looking like a what's it called seminomatous component. And then to me, I don't know if this is a mixed tumor. I'm just giving you my best guess. This stuff here is looking way more yucky. Um, and then particularly over here, you start to see um, more and more carnage. So the yolk sac tumor is up next. These things, alpha fetoprotein all the time. If you got AFP and only AFP, yolk sac tumors in your differential, then you see the biopsy and confirm. So it's got a very characteristic histology. A microcystic pattern. That's why I brought up that the seminoma is solid and not cystic because this dude is. And so cystic means a lot of hollow spaces in there. We've got these pathognomonic. Uh, that means this is the only disease that we know of that has this particular feature. We've got these pathognomonic Schiller Duval bodies, which I'm not going to try to explain that with words. I'm just going to show you one of these. Here it is in the middle. You've got va uh, a vascular core. But then you've got just palisading uh, cells going outwards from around this vascular center. And then you've kind of got a moat starting to form around it. You know, if you could see this cystic space around it. So that is a Schiller Duval body. And you've also kind of got another one up here. Um, feel free to take a look at that picture when you get your hands on these slides. No Schiller Duval body in this. It might not show you one. 
Because if it's path and mnemonic, every student taking the test is going to know exactly what it is, you know. So sometimes they don't show you the path and mnemonic stuff. So the yolk sac tumor is going to have what I would describe as vacuolated honeycombing cells. It's going to look like you just cut open a beehive and you're staring at it. And vacuolated, like really, really, you know, not just, oh, there's a little glycogen in these cells. Like these cells are inflated, you know, they're, they're huge. They've, they've been puffed. They're marshmallows. You might see a pediatric yolk sac tumor, which looks really similarly histologically, but has some genetic changes. It's hypermethylated rather than having this isochromosome 12. Elevated AFP in 90% of cases. We've got a choriocarcinoma. This is a bad tumor. This tumor kills a lot of people. Invasive with trophoblastic differentiation, composed of syncytiotrophoblasts and cytotrophoblasts. Extremely rare in its pure form. Most frequently, it's a component of mixed germ cell tumors. So that means you got part seminoma, part choriocarcinoma, or part yolk sac, part choriocarcinoma. These things will present with hormonal symptoms because they're making such an extreme amount of beta human chorionic gonadotropin, which we talked about has homology with the luteinizing hormone receptor, the follicular stimulating hormone receptor, the thyroid stimulating hormone receptor. So any end organ or target tissue that responds to LH or FSH or TSH is going to respond to the beta HCG produced by this choriocarcinoma, which makes human chorionic gonadotropin because its cell of origin is derived from the chorionic villus of the placenta, which is the coupling agent between mother and child cytologically. And HCG is a hormone that is particular to this one type of cell, the trophoblasts, and there are two subtypes. So because normally your chorionic villus is very invasive, get this, yo, like what's the placenta do? Well, it just grows and grows and grows. And if a little bit of it dies, it just grows again. And it's for months straight, these trophoblasts, their only function is to grow as fast as possible and to invade and dig in to uh, the developing fetus to anchor it, you know, so it makes firm connections. It's kind of like, um, it's like the cellular, it's like the tissue version of just drilling a nice long screw into a couple boards to hold them together. So you can imagine if you've got a cancer of this particular type of tissue, it's going to drill all around it and it's going to drill into the bloodstream. And so it's very easy for this thing to go elsewhere in the body. And not only is it drilling into the bloodstream, it's releasing HCG into the bloodstream, which is why you're going to see gynecomastia in these patients. So <laughs> I was going to talk about gynecomastia. I think I talked about that in a different SEO. No, I talked about that later in this one. I'll save it. So interestingly enough, Graves' disease can give you a gynecomastia as well. Because Graves' disease got a lot of TSH. Because you're hypothyroid in Graves, right? You dig. So if you're hypothyroid, what do you do? You throw some TSH on it. You hope that it does something. So you got all this TSH floating around. It's got an alpha subunit with sequence homology to LH. And so that TSH weakly binds the LH receptor and gets the ball rolling on some testosterone synthesis, which then just shuffles on over to your Sertoli cells and it gets popped into estrogen. And so there's your gynecomastia in men with Graves' disease. Now, we're out of adult tumor territory. Uh, 
I don't want to say that actually. We're going to talk a little bit about teratomas, which are pediatric tumors. Typically, you might see adult teratomas as well. And so that's the big part of this section of the SDL is what are the differences between the childhood and the adult teratoma. So teratoma is just a tumor with two or three germ cell layers involved and a weird sort of uh, histopathology that you would not expect in that organ. For example, you might see bone, you might see cartilage, you might see squamous pearls, you might see glands such as those found in the stomach or duodenum. And the way that they love to give you the teratoma or the hamartoma for that matter in the question stem is to say you biopsy this thing and the pathologist could not cut it, literally could not cut it with a scalpel. So it's like, oh, you know that there's some bone and some hard dense fibrotic mass in there. Now, adult testicular teratomas always have isochromosome 12p. So if you have confidence in yourself, you're going to remember that, you know, it's like, you can just stop there. You can just skip to the kids teratomas because all the adult ones are going to have that 12p. They're going to give that to you in the questions. And I would probably bank on it or they'll ask a question about it. Adult teratomas are sometimes epidermoid cysts. Now, that's also on your differential of pediatric tumors, the epidermoid cysts. But if you see one in the adult, what sets this apart histologically is that you don't see any changes indicative of germ cell neoplasia in situ. So things like loss of sperm production, you know, you'd see a lot of normal testicle if you were biopsying this epidermoid cyst. And it's epidermoid, means it's like the epidermis. So you see a lot of skin-related structures like squamous epithelium and sebaceous glands. They don't metastasize. And key sentence, the lack of 12p abnormalities are is useful in distinguishing epidermoid cysts from teratomas. I don't think they want you to do that. I think there's much higher yield material in this SDL, but if you want to memorize that, go ahead. Something, something, getting into, you know, kind of the nitty gritty of it here. Uh, I just recognized the word parthenon, parthenogenetic. And uh, what that means is that parthenogenesis or parthenogenesis is going to be uh, reproduction without fertilization. And so a handful of organisms are capable of that. I think one being a, a sea urchin. I remember a parthenogenesis experiment with a sea urchin from college. And so you can actually grow these sea urchins without having uh, to have a sexual reproductive partner. That's really it. Again, those last two paragraphs are, are fluff. Mixed germ cell tumors, you got two different cell types in there. Uh, and if you got two different cell types, that means one of them is not a seminoma, you know, and so you're going to have some necrosis and some hemorrhage. Easy. Burned out germ cell tumor. Uh, <laughs> burned out medical student tumor, you know. It's like, uh, so these things met, and then what's going on is that there was a tumor in the testicles, but it's not there anymore. So what are they going to ask you about that? I don't know, man. Testicular tumors spread very predictably. Retroperitoneally. And then up the paraaortic lymph nodes into the thoracic duct where they like to go to the left supraclavicular lymph node, which is just right there above where the thoracic duct spits out into the subclavian vein. And then they can get into the subclavian vein and go anywhere in the body that they want. They tend to go to the lung. Choriocarcinomas have a tendency to go to the lung and the brain, bad organs. Again, choriocarcinomas are the most invasive of all your testicular tumors because they have a trophoblastic component, and the only purpose of that cell and tissue is to dig into other tissues and anchor itself into there. That's its physiologic function. That's its pathologic identity. Now, we're done with germ cell tumors. Sex cord stromal tumors. What's the cell of origin for these? Lady cells, 
Sertoli cells, granulosa cells. So if they give you one of these, it's probably going to be the Leydig cell tumor because, I mean, we got hella histology pictures on it here, and then we have no photos of the Sertoli cell tumor and no photos of the granulosa cell tumor. So I'm just going to treat this like they will not ask you about the granulosa cell. They don't want to ask you about that. Uh, if they ask you about the Sertoli cell tumor, I mean, nothing they're going to ask is too different from the Leydig cell tumor. Only thing that sets the Sertoli tumor apart is that it's got a tubular element to it, uh, which could be, you know, you know what tubules look like. Uh, let me see if I got a photo of that in the slides. Yeah, so here's a Sertoli cell tumor with a tubular component to it. And another one, you can see these tubules reminiscent of our proximal and distals in the kidneys versus the Leydig cell tumor, which normal kidney on the right, tumor on the left. You really don't see any tubules up in that neoplastic section there. Uh, really no tubules here again. And really no tubules here again. Like, Here's a normal one, here's a normal one, but it's like these haven't been affected by cancer. And so it's like, where's the mess in between normal tubules? It's probably a Leydig cell tumor. And uh, Leydig cell tumors, Leydig cell tumors. Got this uh, pathognomonic Reinke crystal. And uh, a hard dude to see. It took me a couple minutes to spot these things. Um, so here I'll erase my highlights. And so check it out. Observe where the Reinke crystals are. I'll put them back. There we go. And one more time. And there are these rod shaped things uh, like straws or french fries. Here's one, just one in the middle of this slide. I'll erase it, take a good look at it. That's a ranky crystal. Don't blink or you'll miss it. There it is. Finally, sex cord stromal tumors, no AFP, no HCG, no markers. You get a marker, it's a non-seminomatous germ cell tumor. Uh, so in conclusion, we looked at a lot of histology. This is going to be a photo heavy uh, section of the exam. I'm still confused. Yo, I'm still confused. Where are the hell these germ cell tumors come from? Because right here, it's like germ cell tumors arise by transformation of totipotent germ cells. But then it's like down here, it's like seminomas arise from the germinal epithelium of the seminiferous tubules. And it's like I look up germinal epithelium and it's like, oh yeah, they're just plain epithelial cells. And it's like, what in the world? And so it's like, they're not going to ask us about that, but it's like for the sake of the completion of my knowledge, man, I'm still bugged. So if somebody has the answer to that, please hit me. Please tell me. Please teach me. I really want to know. That's it.